to the Exploress, time traveling through history one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. Cleopatra, the last great queen of Egypt, doesn't really need an introduction. You can see her in your mind already, can't you? Pretty and sultry with her cat-eye makeup, covered head to toe in shiny gold. Extravagant, self-serving, ruthless. This epic seductress used every magic trick in her lady arsenal to hold on to power, no matter the cost. That's the Cleopatra the ancient Romans want us to see. The truth is that few women's stories have been more brutally revised by sexist haters threatened by a woman's right to rule. The Romans used her as a scapegoat to explain away to powerful Roman men's actions, because there's no way big top dogs Julius Caesar and Mark Antony would have done the crazy things they did for her unless she used her feminine wiles to lay down some sexy sorcery. Most Roman writers take pains to make her the villain of their stories. Ancient writers got out their hater brush for Cleopatra, running one of the ancient world's most effective smear campaigns. Where we might see an intelligent, savvy, thoughtful leader, ancient writers turn her into, as Cicero put it, an uncommonly impertinent harlot. Cassius Dio calls her a woman of insatiable sexuality and insatiable avarice. Plutarch claims she showed unseemly opulence. Flavius Josephus jumps on the slut-shaming wagon and calls her an extravagant woman who was by nature very covetous and a slave to her lusts. Roman poet Lucan, the drama queen, calls her the shame of Egypt, the lascivious fury who was to become the bane of Rome. Greek writers supposedly called her Mariocane, which translates to something like, She who gapes wide for 10,000 men. Uh, rude. The themes here are clear. Cleo wanted too much, in bed and in politics, and was way too greedy and emotionally volatile to be trusted with any real power. But clear away the acrid smoke of sexist Roman killjoys and another picture emerges of a deft and capable pharaoh who ruled one of the most powerful empires the ancient world would ever see. This last pharaoh of Egypt was dealt an impossible hand, and yet she stayed on top of the game for decades when lesser women would have crumbled. Temptress, schemer, mother, witch party girl, strategist, warrior. Over the years, she's collected an impressive list of adjectives, her image fixed in our imaginations. But is that image nothing more than a fantasy? We don't know what she looked like. We have next to nothing in her own words. Only one can possibly be credited to Cleo, though it's pretty fitting. In 33 BCE, either she or her scribe signed a royal decree with the Greek word ginistoi, or make it so. And though we all know her name, so much about her is a mystery. Who was Cleopatra, beyond the smoke and hate and all that glitter? Let's travel back and see if we can find her. Grab your strappy sandals, some hot pink smoke bombs, and your shiniest diadem. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My pirate queens, Amy C., Becky, Chloe, Emily H., Aaron M., Jackie, Jamie, Jessica B., Justine, Kara, Kayla, Lauren O., Lydia, Marie Claire, Mira, Mikkel, Morgan, Samantha, Sean, Stephanie, and Wendy, and my lady presidents, Ellie, Alicia, Kat, Kim, Pamela, Audrey, Jeanette, Nicole M., Iris, Courtney H., Larissa, Holly, Elspeth, Claire S., Catherine, Amanda, Courtney, and Kiru, Paul, Emily C., Diana, Casey, Louisa, Catherine B., Elizabeth M., Sasha, Krista, Karen R., Debbie, Meg, Sarah S., another equally fabulous Sarah S., Caroline, Amanda H., Crystal, Kelly F., Wendy N., Ginger, Belinda, Veronica, Lauren K., Mary, Alexis, Eve, Kelly, Amanda, Amy, Brendan, Townsend, Maggie, K., 
Caitlin, Melissa, Elizabeth G, Dana, Nancy, and Cassie. And to the Imperators and Augustas who give me more each month than I ask for. Jackie C, Jessica S, Karen C, Avery, and Lee. Becoming a patron really helps keep the show going, and you get access to exclusive bonus episodes. I'm about to throw one up all about one of Cleo's feisty ancestors. And you get discounts on merch, Q&As, exclusive interviews, polls, and more. To find out all about it, just go to my website. Before we dive in, I'd like to point out there's a reason I've saved Cleopatra for so late in season two, instead of talking about her in our Egypt chapter. To truly understand her story, you'll need to have listened to my series on women in ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome thus far, particularly the episodes on Lady Pharaohs and Olympias, Alexander the Great's mom. Those will give you the background you need to really appreciate the world we're about to time travel back to. Let's start around 69 BCE, around when our Cleopatra is born. Let's hover over the Nile River Delta, right over the port city of Alexandria, and soak in the big picture. If you're a visual learner and you'd like a classy map of ancient Egypt to look at while we discuss, just jump on the show notes and find the one I've made for you. You might be picturing, say, Nefertiti or Hatshepsut's Egypt, but Cleo's world looks very different than it did when our other female pharaohs ruled the world. This soon-to-be pharaoh queen comes into Egypt at the tail end of its majesty. We're more than 2,000 years past the construction of the Great Pyramids at Giza, and it's been more than a thousand years since the last lady pharaoh we covered, Toosret, was rocking that crook and flail. And though Cleo is considered Egypt's last pharaoh, it turns out that in some ways she isn't Egyptian at all. Between the New Kingdom period, which starts in the 16th century BCE and saw such lady greats as Nefertiti and Hatshepsut, and 69 BCE, Lady Egypt was invaded and overrun by foreign powers, such as the Assyrians and Babylonians. You could say it's been a rotating door of extremely bad dates. Then, finally, in swept Alexander the Great, that studly Macedonian god-king who absolutely slayed when it came to dominating other empires. Alex is pretty famous, as we've already covered, for building the largest empire the ancient world would ever see, and giving every Greek and Roman after him a very tiny man complex. By the time Olympias' son arrived in Egypt on his steed in 332 BCE, the Egyptians are maybe almost kind of excited to see him. I mean, at least he's acting like a proper pharaoh. And he isn't Persian, so... That's good. Let's declare him an Egyptian god and make him pharaoh. God status achieved, Alexander set about putting his personal stamp on this part of the Mediterranean. It was while trotting through Egypt to see an oracle in 331 BCE that he had a vision of a great city that would link Greece and Egypt. It would be some 20 miles west of the Nile's opening, on a narrow spit of land jutting out between the sea and a lake. A canal dug to the Nile would provide fresh water and transport to the interior. He called it Alexandria, because he sure did love naming cities after himself. But then he died rather suddenly at the tender age of 32, and he didn't leave clear directions about who should take over after him. So after some very tense skirmishing, his land was divvied up among his closest bros. Cassander got Macedonia and Greece, Lysimachus got Anatolia, and this guy named Ptolemy got Palestine, Cilicia, Petra, Cyprus, and, you guessed it, Egypt. This ancestor of our girl Cleopatra was actually a childhood friend of Alexander's, the son of a country squire and a princess. For a time, he was also Alex's official taster, which may be why the Ptolemies seemed to have a bit of a thing for poison. But Ptolemy had a problem. How did he get the people of Egypt to see him as their leader? Luck would have it that as he was mulling over this particular problem, he was helping escort Alexander's body back to Macedonia for burial. Then Ptolemy had a bit of a light bulb moment. You know what? I'm gonna steal that body. And so he whisked Alex's corpse away to Alexandria, put him in a gold sarcophagus in a very public place, and was like, See Alex, everybody? 
all draped in gold. What a total god, am I right? And you know, I'm basically kind of maybe related to him, so that means I'm a god too. And it totally makes sense that I become your new pharaoh. So don't try to overthrow me, okay? And that is how a Macedonian Greek family came to rule Egypt for the next 300 years. I'm sure some Egyptians were lukewarm on this new regime and about moving the capital city from Thebes to Alexandria. But the Egyptians really wanted to make their country great again, and for that, they needed a ruling family. And unlike the people who'd ruled previously, at least the Ptolemies actually based themselves in Egypt, and they were eager to lean right into Egyptian culture, at least in some ways. They cast off their Greek get-ups and full-on adopted that Egyptian god-king lifestyle, seducing the people into thinking, that maybe Ptolemy was meant to rule after all. Going Egyptian also meant reintroducing the whole brother-sister-daddy-wife incestuous marriage cycle. When he first settles in Egypt, Ptolemy is all ready to follow Macedonian custom. Just like Olympias' husband Philip II and Alexander, he took several wives. But then his daughter, Arsinoe II, saw an opportunity. She convinced her full-blood brother, also named Ptolemy, to marry her against Greek custom, thus establishing herself as his co-ruler, his equal. I have a lot to say about Arsinoe's roller coaster of a life and how she set the tone for all the women to come after her, including our Cleo. You'll find a bonus episode all about her life on my Patreon very soon. For now, let's just say that introducing royal incest helped Ptolemaic women once again find themselves a clear path to the power seat, if they're game enough to grab it. Dynastic origins established, we fast forward through several decades of intense family rivalry to get back to 69 BCE. As we do, be aware that this family has a very short list of baby names. There's really only one for boys, Ptolemy. And for girls, there are three. Berenice, Arsinoe, and Cleopatra, which is actually a Greek name, did you know, meaning glory of her fatherland. To keep things straight, they often picked up nicknames. That first Ptolemy, for example, was Ptolemy Soter, which meant savior. Humble much? Historians have also given each of them numbers so we can tell who's who. Still, this family tree is a bit of a tangled ball of yarn situation. If you'd like a visual to help make sense of this twisty-turny timeline, I've made one for you. It's over in the show notes. It must be said that the Ptolemy family makes the Lannisters from Game of Thrones look like a bunch of My Little Ponies. They're incestuous and cutthroat like the Lannisters, but they take both of these things to a whole other level. Don't like your brother husband? Poison him, naturally. Want dad out of the way? Knife to the ribs, no big deal. When it comes to role models, Cleopatra has some intense female family members to learn from. We'll talk about Arsinoe too, that first Ptolemy's daughter, in that bonus I mentioned. But some high and low lights of her life include marrying a king, having that king deposed by her half-brother, marrying her half-brother, having her two sons murdered in front of her by that half-brother, fleeing half-brother, fleeing home to Egypt to convince her full-blood brother to marry her and becoming the most influential woman in the ancient world. Alrighty. A bit further down the family tree, we have mother-daughter duo Cleopatra's two and three. Cleo three isn't a big fan of her mom, it seems, so she deposes her and promptly marries her mother's husband and her own uncle, Ptolemy VIII. Never mind that his nickname is Fiscon or Potbelly. Just lie on back and think of Egypt. But Cleo too isn't about to retire and move to the Gold Coast. She raises an army and uses it to drive Cleo III and brother-husband right out of Egypt. Ptolemy VIII gets her back by murdering their son together, chopping him into several pieces, and sending him wrapped up in a bow to Alexandria for Cleo II's birthday. Wait, what? Eventually, they put the past behind them and settle into a very bizarre ruling threesome. I'll bet they all sleep super soundly. This is all to highlight a simple, strange truth about Cleopatra's story. She is born and raised in what's essentially the family edition of The Hunger Games. She grows up surrounded by subterfuge, political backbiting, and the kind of life where you never drink out of a cup before a slave tastes it for you. 
She knows that if she doesn't end up in power herself, whoever does will see her as a threat and seek to destroy her. It's a life where loyalty means both everything and nothing, where love can be a powerful bond and a weakness, and trust is a luxury you often can't afford. Kara Cooney, author of the excellent book When Women Ruled the World, puts it best when she wrote, Ptolemaic life was one of persistent PTSD. Would Clea run through the gilded halls of the palace with her sisters, laughing and playing make-believe, before getting old enough to understand that they'll probably end up killing each other? Was there love here, or only animosity? It's easy to imagine that this childhood doesn't engender much trust or compassion. It does, however, shape her to successfully rule a country in a very troubled time. But to make it to adulthood, which is no guarantee, she'll have to have a sharp mind, a clear grasp of politics, a decisive wit, the ability to adapt to changing circumstances, a strong sense of self-worth, and a real feeling of entitlement. Luckily, she'll have all these things in spades. Cleo's father is a guy named Ptolemy XII. He became unlikely pharaoh in 80 BCE when the direct family line looked up and was like, Wait, did we just kill everybody in the direct line of succession? Ah, oh, we did. Better find a second cousin. He was the son of a Ptolemy, Ptolemy IX, Soter II, but his mom was only one of his side pieces, so his claim to the throne was tenuous at best. His grandmother, the cutthroat Cleo III, sent him away from Alexandria years before to keep him out of danger, and he's been spending time doing, well, we have no idea what. Maybe he was groomed for kingly greatness, or maybe he looked up in 80 BCE and was like, Wait, what? Me? Be Pharaoh? Oh, I mean, sweet. Yeah, I guess I can make that work. Since the elite of Alexandria are big on their kings being too legit to quit, he makes sure to solidify his claim quickly, renaming himself the New Dionysus to give himself some extra swagger. But most people call him by one of two nicknames, Nothis, or Bastard, and Aulates, Greek for piper or flute player. This last because he's fond of playing an oboe-like instrument that is apparently a favorite among prostitutes. Okay, but it works for Cleo's dad. He's fond of wine, parties, women, and wailing on that flute. As Strabo said, Apart from his general licentiousness, he practiced the accompaniment of choruses with the flute, and upon this he prided himself so much that he would not hesitate to celebrate contests in the royal palace, and at these contests would come forward to vie with the opposing contestants. Though in the midst of all these epic jam sessions, he does a pretty stellar job of producing future Ptolemies. It's interesting to note that though the family is into incestuous closed-loop marriages, it doesn't seem that they have the same incest-related issues as earlier dynasties. That might be because, though Ptolemy XII does marry his sister, or maybe his cousin? Cleopatra V, Tryphena, he definitely takes unrelated mistresses on the side. The Ptolemies don't have official harems like the old dynasties did, just alliances outside of wedlock, which can make lines of succession fairly confusing. Some people think Cleo herself might have been the product of such a union. Either way, we know next to nothing about her mom of record, Cleopatra V, who falls off the face of ancient records around the same time Cleo's born. Ptolemy, the sexy flautist, also has two sons, both named Ptolemy, as you do, and two other daughters, Berenice and Arsinoe. Cleo, we think, is the middle child. There's a lot we don't know for certain about Cleo's childhood, but plenty we can infer. For one, she's raised by a horde of royal helpers, wet nurses, nannies, servants, bodyguards, hangers-on, all hoping to make their young charge the next king or queen of Egypt. They fight her battles until she's old enough to fight them for herself. There will be at least one official taster who chews her stewed carrots to make sure there isn't any poison in them. When no one's trying to kill her, it's a lush and indulgent existence in one of the ancient world's richest and most beautiful cities. 
Imagine her running down hallways filled with tiles of ebony and ivory, over lush Persian carpets and leopard skin rugs, through doors decorated with mother of pearl, garnet, and topaz. She's playing in palace gardens where keen zoologist Ptolemy II is said to have once kept giraffes, bears, and pythons. She's taking trips down the Nile during festival season, cruising between Alexandria and Memphis, dressed up and participating in cult rituals to remind the people of the family's divine right to rule. Through it all, she's receiving the best education a Hellenic girl can buy. And she's an excellent student, keen to soak up everything she can. Let's talk about her hometown, as it's a place whose streets will want to get lost in. Despite the many years of stabby family relations between that first Ptolemy and this latest one, the family has managed not only to hold onto and expand Egypt's borders, but to bring Alexander's dream city to life. It's in essence a Greek city, full of Greek language, art, and culture, but with distinctly Egyptian accents. If the ancient world had a most livable cities list, Alexandria would top it every time. Sailing into this walled city on a narrow strip of peninsula, you'll be greeted by the city's great pharos, or lighthouse. It's the world's first such structure, and it's the reason we call tall buildings with flaming lights atop them lighthouses. It has some five levels and stands around 450 feet, or 140 meters, tall, guiding sailors into port with fire by night and smoke by day, and, we think, using metal mirrors to send the light out over the water. It will survive for a staggering 17 centuries. They sure don't build them like they used to. Once you've landed, you'll find yourself strolling along a long, wide boulevard called the Canopic Way. It's the grandest street in the ancient world. Eighty chariots can ride down it side by side without touching. All the better for holding grand parades, which the Ptolemies are quite fond of. It runs from east to west, lined with elegant columns and silk tapestries, capped by the Gate of the Moon on the east and the Gate of the Sun on the west. The royal complex is quite prominent, located near the harbor. Beyond it, you'll find bustling market stalls, vibrant shops, street performers, and lots of ibis birds. These black and white scavengers are sacred to the Egyptians, tied to Thoth, the god of wisdom and writing. But watch out, they'll steal your lunch if you let them. I once had one snatch a sandwich right out of my hand with its long, creepy beak. Here's what Strabo had to say about it. The city has exceedingly beautiful public places and palaces covering a quarter or a third of its area. Since each of the kings, just as he contributed some enhancement to the public monuments, so too he added to the existing buildings a private residence, so that now, as the poet says, they are one on top of the other. Ships pour into this port from all over, bringing silk and spices, ebony, ivory, aromatic plants, precious metals, scrolls, perfumes, and more. In turn, Egyptian grain flies out, marching off to feed a huge proportion of the population in places like Rome. The city is heavily influenced by Greece in terms of style, language, and its love of the arts, and thus feels very different than the rest of Egypt. You'll find public baths, a massive gymnasium, and temples dedicated to both Greek and Egyptian gods. It's as New York City is to New York State, a part of the greater whole, to be sure, but also its own bustling world. Alexandria is a diverse city. It links India, Arabia, Africa, and the Western world, and being a port, it's full of riches and wonders. People come here from everywhere, and its citizens love to have fun, to live out loud and in color. It is not easy for a stranger to endure the clamor of so great a multitude, said one Alexandrian tourist, or to face these tens of thousands unless he comes provided with a lute and a song. It's separated into ethnic quarters, all called by letters of the alphabet, making Alexandria perhaps one of the earliest cities to have street addresses as we recognize them now. Jews, Greeks, Egyptians, and others are running their own parts of town, but also mixing and melting around the many theaters, bordellos, and warehouses. And they aren't afraid to express their feelings. Riots and protests aren't uncommon. Looking at the city, I doubted whether any race of men could ever fill it, one native wrote. Looking at the inhabitants, I wondered whether any city could ever be large enough to hold them all. 
The Ptolemies have taken great pride in making Alexandria a place of art and learning. The city's famous library contains the greatest collection of knowledge in the ancient world. It's called the Mauseon, which is Greek for a seat or shrine of the muses, and is where we get the word museum from. Ptolemy Soter was known to hoard everything ever written on a quest to create the world's largest book collection. A man after my own heart, to be sure. He sent emissaries all over the world to acquire them, raiding book fairs in Rhodes and Athens. He even plundered ships coming into harbor for their scrolls. Oh, don't worry, he'd say. I'll have my scribes make a copy and give the original back. You know, probably. Some say the Mauseon houses 500,000 scrolls, though it's probably more like 100,000, including some of Sappho's banging poetry. A massive number when you consider this is a time when everything is written out by hand. There's a museum attached where a community of scholars are given tax-free room and board so they can focus on thinking big thoughts together. The circumference of the world is first measured here, coming within a few hundred miles of accurate. The sun is pinned at the center of our solar system. Legend has it that Archimedes, the guy, not the owl from Disney's Sword in the Stone, sadly, invented his Archimedes screw here, which is a pump for transporting water from below ground to above. Kind of a big deal. This is the intellectual center of the world. If you're in Rome and your tutor didn't train in Alexandria, then he's a hack job, and don't let anyone tell you different. Cleopatra has all of this at her fingertips and lives in a society where it's cool for royal women to know things. Not just royals, but women in general. Alexandria is home to lady doctors, painters, poets, and later, mathematicians like Hypatia. You don't even have to be noble to get an education. We talked in another episode about a woman named Agna Dicey, who came from Greece to Alexandria so she could train to be a doctor, then practice secretly back home, even though she wasn't allowed. While Roman tend to think women are at their best when they're quiet, barefoot, and pregnant. Egyptians like an educated woman. You know, as long as she doesn't cause too much trouble. Cleopatra is probably studying math, geometry, and astronomy, and knowing her dad, there are probably some music lessons thrown in there. She's reading the classics and memorizing epic poems. Imagine her sitting on the palace steps, reading Homer's The Iliad in the original Greek. Her tutors make sure to instruct her in rhetoric, how to persuade, convince, and manipulate someone into seeing your side of things. She seems to take a shine to languages. Plutarch tells us she speaks Greek, of course, and Hebrew, plus the languages of the Medes, Parthians, Arabs, Syrians, Troglodytes, a word that in Greek means cave dwellers, and an Ethiopian language that Plutarch says is like the screeching of bats. She's apparently the only one of her siblings who bothers learning native Egyptian, the same language her seven million subjects speak. She must know the power that comes from being able to communicate directly with the people, whether they be Macedonian or Egyptian. I hope she occasionally wanders out into the city in disguise, all jasmine-like, and eavesdrops on all the hot gossip. Our Greek writer friend Plutarch, like pretty much all of our sources, never meets Cleopatra himself. He won't be born until around 45 CE, but he still has lots to say about her, including how lovely she is to listen to. It was a pleasure merely to hear the sound of her voice, with which, like an instrument of many strings, she could pass from the language to another, so that there were few of the barbarian nations that she answers by an interpreter. To most of them, she spoke herself. A word on Cleo's looks, since history tends to be obsessed with them. We have many pieces of art that depict Cleopatra, but the truth is that we don't know what she looked like. And though the shade of her skin seems like a historical bone of contention, it's unlikely that she was a woman of color in the strictly Egyptian sense. Being from Macedonian Greek stock, she probably has an olive complexion and very little, if any, African descent in her family tree, though of course it's a possibility. The Ptolemy kings did take many mistresses, and some of them might have been Egyptian or Nubian, but for traditional wives, they tended to go Greek. It's telling that the most potentially accurate portrait we have of her is from the coins she minted. On them, she looks precisely nothing like Elizabeth Taylor. Prominent nose, exaggerated features, and a very manly Greek look. But this is a coin we're talking about, which in the ancient world is a powerful piece of propaganda. 
And these have all the hallmarks of an Egyptian ruler trying to make herself look imposing to solidify her place. So we'll just have to use our imaginations. But she is entrancing, to be sure. Plutarch, of course, has thoughts. He insists that Cleo isn't beautiful. Instead, he writes, her bearing is... Not in itself so remarkable that none could be compared with her, or that no one could see her without being struck by it, but... The contact of her presence, if you lived with her, was irresistible. The attraction of her person, joining with the charm of her conversation and the character that attended all that she said or did, was something bewitching. In terms of her place on the power ladder, we don't know if she's being groomed to be pharaoh. Given that she's not the firstborn or a man, it's unlikely. But she would be groomed for pharaohdom by default. With the Ptolemies, you never know who's going to end up on top. And you can be sure that clever Cleo has her eyes and ears wide open. It's worth repeating that this Egypt is very different than the one we left Nefertiti and Tawos read in. Even Cleo would have seen those women as ancient history. This country has been broken open, globalized, and exploited by outsiders. As the breadbasket of the Mediterranean, the superpowers all around it see it as a prized jewel worth taking. One of those covetous powers is the almighty ancient Rome. If Rome and Egypt had a Facebook relationship status, it would definitely be It's Complicated. Rome is the Mediterranean world's greatest military power, and they're insatiably hungry, gobbling up nations left and right. They would just love to invade and run Egypt as a client state, but it's too big to control, and they're stretched pretty thin already. Plus, whatever individual general conquered it would have a whole lot of power that he could use to turn around and seize control of what is, right now, the Roman Republic. Better to make sure that whoever's ruling Egypt is firmly on the side of Team Rome. Cleo's dad, Aulites, isn't afraid to wave his Team Rome foam finger, since he inherited a land with crippling debts. A previous Ptolemy actually left Egypt to Rome in his will, which means it's hard to shut them out completely. And in a family, when someone's always trying to steal your throne, it pays to have powerful friends. So like many Ptolemies before him, he increasingly looks to Rome for legitimacy, giving them troops and money in exchange for their support. For context, this is right around the time when our favorite threesome, Pompey, Julius Caesar, and Crassus, or the First Triumvirate, are causing mad trouble over in Rome. Ptolemy supposedly pays Pompey and Caesar 6,000 talents to be his special friend. It's hard to translate what that would mean in modern money, but we're talking a lot of dollar bills. The Alexandrians do not like how chummy he's getting with these outsiders, and the city's population isn't afraid to stage a good old-fashioned riot, which they do. And Aulates is like, Shit, man. I just want to throw parties and play my flute. Is that so wrong? But then he goes too far. The Romans take over the island of Cyprus, which Ptolemy's brother rules, and he does nothing to stop it. His brother kills himself rather than give in to the invaders, and it royally pisses everyone off. So Egypt kicks Aulites out, and he and a teenage Cleopatra flee to Rome. At least we think she does. She might stay in Alexandria. Like so much about her life, it's unclear. Either way, the throne is empty, y'all. Let the games be ever in your favor. Big Sister Berenice ends up nabbing the prize. It turns out that the Egyptians dislike Ptolemy XII so much that they're willing to have a teenage girl at the helm instead. But she is a woman ruling alone, and we all know that won't do. So her loyal followers pressure her to marry someone ASAP. One of her brothers would be best, but they're really young, so she lets the people choose for her. The chosen suitor is a prince from the massive Seleucid Empire in what is now Syria, and whose name is, inevitably, Seleucid. But he must be either really boring or flosses in bed, because within a week she supposedly has him strangled. Boy, bye! Next up is Archelaos from Anatolia, who fares a bit better, but he has about as much power as the pool boy who fans Berenice's face with a palm frond. Cleo's big sister is running the show. Meanwhile, over in Rome, Ptolemy XII isn't holed up in an Airbnb eating all his feelings. He's petitioning. 
<coughs> bribing anyone who will listen to help him take back his throne. If Cleopatra is with him, she's getting a serious lesson in how to market yourself and bribe with abandon. Dad plasters posters around the forum and Senate. Vote for me. I play the flute and gifts people with fancy canopied couches, the ancient equivalent of a really cool Vespa. In fact, he's so up in Rome's business that in 56 BCE, our pal Cicero complains that his suit has gained a highly invidious notoriety. Pompey is the one who puts Alates and Cleo up and speaks on their behalf in the Senate, a favor that he hopes will be repaid someday in full. When a hundred delegates from Egypt arrive to protest Alates' return to the kingship, he throws a royal hissy, poisoning their leader and either murdering or bribing the rest to leave town. Classy. And so it is that, with a whole lot of palm greasing, Ptolemy marches back to Alexandria in 55 BCE, backed by a Roman army, the first to ever touch down on Egypt's soil. As you can imagine, the Egyptians aren't real thrilled about it. But neither are the Roman soldiers, who aren't keen to brave the scorching desert for a flute-playing foreign bastard. We're Rome, damn it! What are we even doing here? But one young, chiseled Roman officer is totally down. His name is Mark Antony. We met him when we talked about Fulvia. But since he's very important to Cleo's story, I think we should hear his dating profile one more time. Sup, girl? It's General Marky Mark back in the game. Looking to have a good time because I've been killing it since 83. My motto, work hard, play hard, love hard. I ride my chariots fast, fight my bottles fierce, and chug wine straight from the bottle. I love all things Greek, hitting the gym in short tunics, playing practical jokes, and going to parties. It's a wasted night if I'm home before the sun rises, and I ain't wasted. Oh, and the ladies. I love the ladies. Or should I say, the ladies love me. If you think you can handle me, hit me up. This currently 25-year-old up-and-comer will spend time in Alexandria once they take it back for Ptolemy. This may be where he first meets and has lusty feelings for a 13-year-old Cleopatra. Maybe she likes him too, or maybe she just briefly ogles his legs under his Roman armor. Who knows, but keep him in mind. We'll be coming back for him later. When Ptolemy secured the city, he's like, Bye, Bernice. And promptly chops her head off. Nice, Dad. And lucky Cleo probably gets to watch. Being a daughter of the Pharaoh, she must wonder how many steps she might be away from a similar fate. Some say Ptolemy makes her his co-regent at this point, and, thankfully, doesn't try to marry her. Dad clearly likes Cleo, and she likes him. She'll later add the word philopater, or father-loving, to her official king name. Five years later, Ptolemy XII must know he's dying because he writes his will, and in it he does something really annoying. He declares that he wants Cleopatra and her younger brother, Ptolemy XIII, to be co-rulers after he bites it, and he puts them both under Rome's guardianship, which seems like a bad idea all around. Maybe he doesn't think Cleo will be accepted without a man beside her. Maybe he's hedging his bets in case one of them dies. Maybe he sees there's just no surviving as an independent empire without Roman support. Not anymore. Aulites officially calls them Theoi Neoi Philadelphos, new gods and loving siblings, probably hoping they'll also get married, which eventually they do. Yummy. When Dad dies of, incredibly, natural causes, winning! Cleo takes the throne with one hand tied behind her back. She has to share the title with a brother whose team will, from minute one, be trying to get rid of her. Thanks a lot, Dad. But at age 18, Cleo is ready to rule, and she has all the tools she needs for greatness. I can imagine her gazing out her palace window, thinking of everything she's about to do and be. Move over, bitches. I'm about to show you what it means to be a queen. First, she works to get in good with the Egyptians. With the sacred Bookus bull dead, an animal worshipped by a cult near Thebes in Upper Egypt, she sails with the new bull some 600 miles up the Nile, decked out in full ceremonial dress to oversee his inauguration. In fact, she may be the first Ptolemy to do it in person. 
These festivals are sacred moments when the Egyptian people get to see their gods and goddesses to interact with the divine, and Cleo knows it. So she makes sure to present herself at many such religious ceremonies, where the people can see her doing the ancient equivalent of kissing babies and looking like an absolute goddess as she does it. Cleo's go-to goddess is Isis. Ptolemaic women have made an art form out of aligning themselves with this fierce goddess and lady of the underworld. Isis is actually the Greek form of her name. In Egyptian, it's aset, meaning seat or throne. If you'll remember from our earlier Egypt episodes, she's the one who uses powerful magic to resurrect her murdered husband Osiris, whom she gifts with a golden penis so they can have one last epic roll in the hay. The product of that tumble is Horus, the god upon high who protects Egypt's royalty. Isis goes back a long way, all the way to the Old Kingdom, but she really picks up popularity under the Ptolemies. Powerful yet kind, Isis becomes popular even beyond Egypt, with cults popping up all over the Western world, including in Greece and Rome. Royal women going back as far as Arsinoe II take pains to align themselves with Isis, linked to healing, magic, serious fertility, and a potent kind of female power. Cleopatra goes so far as to claim to be her manifestation on Earth, and I think she believes it wholeheartedly. If you'd been told from infancy that you were a child of a new god, you'd probably believe it too. Understanding that Cleo sees herself as a kind of goddess on Earth explains a lot about her outlook. She also takes every opportunity to be like, Um, excuse me, Ptolemy who? Claiming herself as sole ruler on a bunch of monuments, conveniently forgetting to add her brother's name. Whoops. When she goes to make her official coins with her face on them, her brother doesn't feature on the flip side. Ooh, burn. Meanwhile, she's taking a page out of Hatshepsut's book and carving images of herself all over Egypt. I mean, who needs to kill their brother when they're crushing that ancient Instagram feed? This is the Cleo we don't often get to see, an absolute boss, both great at PR and making sure her country runs smoothly. But she's inherited a country in decline on a couple of fronts. The Nile isn't flooding like it used to, people are starving, grain stores aren't what they were, and she keeps stumbling over the issue of how to deal with Rome, whose generals are currently playing a bloody game of political musical chairs as they shift from a Senate-led republic to one that crowns people emperors for life. How can she keep Egypt independent in the midst of Rome's epic civil war between Caesar and Pompey? How to hold Rome at bay without pissing them off? From here on in, Cleopatra is going to spend a lot of time trying to keep the wolves at bay. Or, more accurately, trying to tame them. Egypt may always be going to Papa Rome to help settle their dynastic matters, but Rome is always sailing to sugar mama Egypt for supplies and money. This is the time period when Pompey and Julius Caesar are duking it out for who's going to be Rome's one true leader. It's only a matter of time before one or both of them come calling, asking for ships and money and political backing. Who to choose? This is a big and perilous question. When Pompey's son asks Cleo for troops, she gives them freely. Pompey is the one who got her dad back on the throne, after all. But the Egyptian locals tend to revolt when they're hangry, and this move does not make her friends. There's also what she does when those Roman legions that once helped her dad out were recalled back to Rome. They refused to go, as they'd settled in and started families in Alexandria, and got so upset about it all that they killed the governor's son who came to collect them. Cleo, thinking she's doing a good thing, sends the soldiers back to Rome in chains. Again, Alexandrians are pretty unimpressed by her rolling over to Rome's whims, forsaking their own. And don't forget, there is Ptolemy XIII and his posse to contend with, who are more than ready to get rid of Cleo at the first available opportunity. And then, in 48 BCE, they do just that. They press Pompey to officially claim Ptolemy XIII, Egypt's sole ruler. And Poppy's like, no prob, because I mean, a woman in power? I'll take a hard pass on that. Cleopatra finds herself an exiled queen, fleeing the only home she's ever known with no certainty that she'll ever make it back again, or even that she'll live to see another day. 
She heads to Thebes, then to Syria to try and figure out how to get her throne back. This is where young Cleo really comes into her own. We'll leave Cleo there for now. In part two of our three-part exploration of her story, we'll see what she does when her back's against the wall. With everything to lose, this young exile will use her wit, tenacity, and silver tongue to build herself an army. And then, with a little help from our friend Julius Caesar, she'll fight her way back into the spotlight. This is when the lady will become the legend. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, leave me a review, share it with your friends, or become a patron if you can. For the cost of a cheap cup of coffee a month, you'll get exclusive bonus episodes like the one I'll soon be posting on the epic Arsinoe. Or you can visit my merchandise shop on Etsy, where you'll find lady-centric timelines, maps, cards, and art prints to go along with the things we cover on the show, including ancient Egypt. My art print of Cleopatra is particularly striking, if I do say so myself. Make sure to check out the show notes for this episode, which includes a transcript and a whole lot of cool images, including my map of ancient Egypt and the Ptolemaic family tree. Come find me on Instagram or Facebook at The Explorers Podcast, or Twitter at the Explores Pod. The music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of Derek and Brandon Fischer from their album Ancient Egypt and Keith Zizza, who created a whole bunch of wonderful tracks for a game called Immortal Cities, Children of the Nile, and Michael Levy, whose ancient lyre music gives us a glimpse into the ancient world. To check out their work, see the links in the show notes. Thanks to Mr. Explores for my theme music, artwork, and logo. And thanks to the following legends for their vocal stylings. Veronica Washington Ramos, our sultry Cleopatra. Andrew Yergold, the strapping Mark Antony. John Armstrong, who brought the Ptolemies to life. Paul Gablonski as Strabo. Sean from Stories of Your and Yours podcast as the articulate Plutarch. And Avery Downing as the cranky Cicero. Bye, Bernice.